From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined with our guest producer, Ben the Outlaw Hackett. Uh, Most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Guys, I guess this is sort of our real estate episode in a very dark way. Oh, fun. That sounds (laughs) sexy. Yeah. It's our urban planning episode. (laughs) Let's flip some properties, y'all. Oh, gosh. Yeah. You know, uh, before we get started, have you guys ever speculated on that? I I don't think we've ever talked about it, but have you ever like wanted to be a house flipper? Uh, No, my girlfriend really likes those shows, though. mm -hmm. Um, I kind of can't stand them. Frankly, yeah, <laughs> no, so the, it's got a weird energy. I don't know what it is. Weird uh, energy is a good way to say it. You have to have a certain amount of money in standing to get the first one, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Then once you get that one, sure, you can make some repairs, sell it, get another one. But when you're doing it with like 10, 20, 100 houses at a time, uh, probably not as an individual, right? But mm-hmm. that's one of these giant investment companies we've talked about. It just, it verges on an ick factor that I am very much not comfortable with. Yeah, it, it, it sort of starts to get into slumlord territory after a certain point, right? Very quickly, yeah. And uh, shout out to, I'm not going to name him here, but shout out to one of my old favorite landlords who was a self-professed slumlord. And he was like, a lot of people aren't going to be honest with you about that, Ben. I run slums. Well, yeah, (laughs) that's what I do. (laughs) I never met a slum I didn't like. (laughs) Something we never, I mean, I guess we've mentioned it before, but we don't talk very much about the the massive corporations that have investments in real estate, Mm -hmm. both commercial and residential, and how those companies also have like 5%, 7% stakes in companies uh, that that manufacture cereal and Mm -hmm. other foods like that and own restaurants and chains and it's all one big, it becomes one big ownership thing. And I think that's what, that's what's at the heart of this episode, the concept of ownership. Yes, indeed. Nailed it. And shout out uh, to BlackRock in the least polite way possible. Uh, <laughs> Berkshire Hathaway and all yeah. these other. We're right. like shouting at BlackRock. There we go. And also, of course, uh, as we mentioned in previous episodes with this, with um, these institutional investors, they are a big part of the drive to get people working back in offices. That's a big part of their calculus. And then also there are algorithms now that automate the pricing of things and it becomes uh, a profit maximization thing. So it's going to have terrible results down the line. But in offices, that somebody at some point walked onto a piece of land, put a flag in the ground, literally, and said, this mine. Yeah. This let's mine get, now. Let, let's get to it. Land. Well, I, I think it came up briefly on, on a previous episode, just this idea of how it's so easy to take for granted the idea that land, you know, that people can't just walk up on your land anymore and say, hey, you got to go. This is mine now. I mean, but at the same time, you know, there is a tenuousness to the nature of like owning property. And it's all just your your one document or misprint away from being dispossessed of your Mm -hmm. land. You know, it's all kind of a bit of an illusion of security. So maybe I take back my whole like thing where it's like, oh, we're all good now we're past that oh i don't know we're in kind of a despite all the dangers we're in kind of a halcyon era of stability uh in in that regard you know and you have to be a citizen of a recognized sovereign country yes yes you do and we'll we'll get to this we'll get to micro nations we'll get to all kinds of things but let's start let's start here with the idea that that we're we're hitting on the right to live on land to move through it to possess that land or the things found upon or under it, and to sell that stuff. It's one of the primary concerns of all human civilizations. And it's not just humans. A lot of animals are very territorial territorial as well. It's a key issue today. Yeah, yeah. Show that it's theirs. They just don't don't have attorneys. 
mm-hmm. and laws, right? right? right. <laughs> well, I can't because wait. Crow ultimately, law. Yeah. it's a law thing. That's all it is. It's a that's law it. thing. Well, and Rule that's what law. I was getting at. The idea, the, the tenuousness of it is that we have these structures, these, these things built into society that we accept to be true that give us certain guarantees, but... It's all just kind of a concept at the end of the day. And mm-hmm. if you're going to get strong armed by someone who's got more legal firepower than you, then it's certainly possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, just like the stock market or the global economy, it's a collective story humanity tells itself. And as long as the majority of people believe in that story, then the magic works. <laughs> so uh, we're talking today about. This weird idea in this very crowded world, fellow conspiracy realists, you may be surprised to find that there is still some land out there on planet Earth that officially nobody wants. Here are the facts. I mean, I love the point you bring up, Noel, that right now most borders are are pretty set. Like there are tons of border disputes all over the world. Uh, but for most of human history, borders were likely to shift back and forth. And this always happened, especially if there wasn't a geographical barrier like a river or an ocean or a mountain range. You know, a couple of months ago, construction started on this lot next to my property um, that had like a burned out house on it. And they, they tore the house down and now they're building something new. And I got a knock on the door and it was my neighbor or the guy that bought the property. And he goes, hey, uh, it's just kind of awkward, but um, looks like your fence line is about uh, – uh, 10 feet oh, no. uh, in, in the wrong place. Oh, boy. And I'm like, he's like, I had a surveyor come out. He's like, I know it's a pain in the butt, but uh, we don't have to worry about it now. We'll deal with it when the time is right. But in my mind, I'm like, do I do I now have to hire a counter surveyor to, to, to prove that this guy's telling the truth? And <laughs> a I do. border dispute in but the it's, neighborhood. It's, it's like a it. weird micro border dispute. I love you know? it. Dude, I, I don't want to tell st- somebody that we work with that we all respect a lot just dealt with this in. Um, Massachusetts and it was really bad and it took a long time Noel so just keep, just be prepared or just it's it's oh, a I don't weird give thing. a crap I'll move the thing he said he'd pay for the moving of the oh fence. that's cool I'm well, not worried about it as long as it's accurate you know I, I, I just like I said it's just it's just an, an, another little nuisance that I have to deal with to hire somebody yeah. to confirm what this guy's saying is true well let's shout out our Venezuela Guiana episode right because that's exactly <laughs> what we're talking about here mm-hmm. and uh, did you guys see the news Exxon Mobil has decided to go ahead and move forward with drilling yeah. explorations right mm-hmm. on that area. Like right or off the coast of that area, uh, which is, again, it all ties back into this episode. Yeah, yeah. We kind of set it up with Venezuela and Guiana. And uh, Exxon has some very important friends in the U.S. military industrial complex. So yeah. they gave they uh, uh, they pretty much gave Venezuela a F.A.F.O. notice. We're trying to keep us a family show on this one. But uh, since we have company oh. over, since Ben's here. Uh, Just F-A. F around and find out situation. Yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, and it's weird because, too, if for anybody, speaking of going to the Northeast map, for anybody who is uh, living or traveling near the U.S.-Canadian border, especially in rural areas, you'll see the way that borders used to be. For most of human history, there's a there's a gradient. There's a gradual change in culture. Like people who live on the U.S. side of the of the Canadian border, often they we saw this in our maple syrup episode. They work in Canada. So every day they get up. They are an international traveler. They pass by like a little equivalent of a phone booth. And then some very nice customs officers like, oh, hey, Jerry, or hey, Aaron, or whatever. And then they drive back. And that whole area, the, especially as you get towards the Pacific, the Pacific Northwest, my gosh, that's a quagmire of uh, property rights issues and like who gets to claim land out there and which which sovereign country that once planted a flag now gets to sell it to the United States. Mm -hmm. And shout out to the dispossessed First Nations and Native Mm -hmm. American communities who struggle today in the court system to regain the land that was stolen from them under Manifest Destiny. I mean, back in the day, it, it might surprise a lot of us to learn how recent modern borders are. As more and more people populated the world, uh, like, here's how it used to work. You would travel probably by foot, maybe on some animal, and the languages would start to get mixed up. 
different currencies would start to be accepted. Think of like the Silk Road. And then all of a sudden, at some point, that is not clearly demarcated. You have left ancient land one. Now you're in ancient land two. And it's, there's not really, unless there's a river, unless there's a mountain or a desert, there's not a way to have a hard border, which is what we have today. The Roman Empire didn't even really fortify their borders militarily. They were, they were trading posts. They were there to like make sure the taxes were paid. And if you went to a place like England, where there weren't a ton of distinctive landmarks, that's where people built walls, like Hadrian's Wall is, is where he said, okay, here. This is going to be the spot. Well, I mean, you know, there are certain uh, elements in, in modern politics that are all about bringing back walls. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like they think it's a it's a it's a surefire and history tested technology and mm-hmm. totally foolproof. D- d- dare we say impenetrable by something like the common ladder. Right. They haven't heard of the asymmetrical warfare <laughs> called the ladder. They're catching up with that one. But also uh, without getting too political. I think a lot of people in the U.S. don't realize there have already been walls for a long, long time. Yeah, there's a big one in Berlin, I heard, for a Mm -hmm. long time. I've got a little piece of it, too. No way. Yeah, yes, wait. Does it have graffiti on it? That's cool. I didn't get one of the cool. I'm sure that was like a premium thing. but Exactly. (laughs) Premium wall chunk. Yeah, they were getting traded all around when the wall fell. It was kind of like how in the military they hand people challenge coins and things like that. So you got a little piece of wall. That was because capitalism came in immediately when the wall fell. Like as soon as the wall fell, a bunch of German people ran up and grabbed little pieces of it and started selling them on the streets. Side hustle. Side hustle. Gig economy, right? Uh, So most modern borders actually date back from just a couple of centuries ago, like the modern versions of them. And many only count their ages in decades. So To the earlier point you made, as permanent as these things may look, they're actually quite ephemeral. They have great capacity for fluidity, you know, Um, borders blur. And even now, borders are defined as much by their disputes as their agreed upon limits, right? Like the, the hard borders that used to exist or that still exist, a lot of those came from the Cold War, the DMZ on the Korean Peninsula, Kashmir, um, the Berlin Wall, like you mentioned. We found a really cool quote from a writer named Joshua Jelly Shapiro, who talks about borders writing for The New Yorker. As a matter of fact, let's just summarize this and and please read Jelly Shapiro's full article here. Uh, Joshua points out that these Cold War scenarios are replicated with borders dividing countries who still have, you know, the shared system of democracy. Their armies are at peace and they still really, really want these borders. Like, look at the border between India, Bangladesh, the way that South Africa handles the Zimbabwean border. Uh, And I didn't know this. In Hungary, for a time, they laced the potato fields with barriers to keep out refugees. And then, like you mentioned, Noel, there's the cyclical U.S.-Mexico border panic, which somehow seems to gain attention only during elections. Do you guys notice that? (laughs) You know, it's, I bet I know you like a good poetry reference, but um, Robert, I didn't realize this until just now when I was looking it up. But Robert Frost is actually the originator of the line "Good fences make good neighbors." Mm-hmm. Comes from a poem, literally about mending a wall from something there is that doesn't love a wall. That's right. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit just about why governments feel these borders are so important, and why they feel it's important to control the human beings migrating across a border. And it goes back to law, right? If you are a citizen of a country, you are beholden through contract, essentially, to the laws of that country. If you're a citizen of another country and you enter into a new country, you're not necessarily subject to laws in the same way. Often, you know, there would be an extradition process to get you out of a country rather than charged with a major crime or something if if you would do it across the border, right? Um, so it's and, about tidiness, right? It's sort of about like keeping things from getting too messy uh, legally, I guess. That's yes, part of it. But you're also not an economic battery for that country that you're operating in, uh, in the form of taxes, right? Mm-hmm. So there's all there are all of these legal reasons and legal apparatuses apparatus that are created to make sure that the trafficking of humans across borders is controlled. Yeah, and it's resource extraction. I think is the primary. The primary thing, and it's treating humans as a resource. 
And I'm not really up on all of the minutia of this, but I, I just got to wonder how something like Brexit figures into this, where oh, like pre-Brexit, boy. you know, there was all of this free uh, movement, you know, of, of United Kingdom citizens throughout Europe, you know, bands that, that, that live there could tour, you know, all throughout Spain and, and Amsterdam and all of the countries that are connected, you know, by rail. And it was a very easy uh, answer. And now with Brexit, all that stuff's out the window. And there's like basically new borders that were like did not previously exist, even though the UK is its own country. Yeah. Uh, well, Brexit is interesting because I was talking with some folks about it and the change was electric. It's a Machiavellian super move in the way that conspiracy was orchestrated. The only people who support Brexit now are the very wealthy who made a lot of money off of it and then immediately relocated their assets to tax-friendly countries. Which is so so hypocritical, because that's like the antithesis of what the whole thing was supposed to be about, right? Yeah. Well, they manifested it. It worked. It sure did. And a lot of people... Perhaps- yeah, a lot of people who supported Brexit didn't really know what they were getting into. So hoping, wishing them the best as the cost of living skyrockets in the UK. But the argument was in some way to keep that those economic batteries, you know, more benefiting the United Kingdom rather than all of this free passage back and right. forth throughout the other surrounding countries, right? Right. The idea was that by being a member of the EU, you are sacrificing your sovereignty as a country. And they were feeling like, hey, we're an independent country. We don't want to be treated like a state of a larger country. Uh, and then, you know, honestly, the vote hinged on a ton of racism. Oh, about yeah. England immigration. for the English. That kind right. of stuff. Very, very uh, V for Vendetta. Very uh, children of men. But this, with all these things, and this is almost a separate episode itself, it leads us to this other question. In a world that's more crowded than ever before, with so many border disputes, so many things just on the tip of becoming hot wars, is there really still land that nobody wants? We'll answer the question after a word from our sponsors. Here's where it gets crazy. Yes, this is our uh, this is our phrase for the evening. The concept is terra nullius, land without a master or unclaimed land. We mentioned this in a previous episode. It's an odd, sometimes conspiracy laden concept that feels nerdy and, past a certain point, incredibly dangerous. It's a group term. It can it can describe a couple of things. It can describe land that nobody wants. It can also describe the idea of sovereign powers exercising squatter rights. Like literally, as we as we said at the top of the show, coming into a place, say, hmm, dibs for England. Yeah, I know we're going to get there, but I, it's got to have something to do with, if nobody wants it, it's probably because it's inconvenient to own or to possess, <laughs> or it's just not strategically of value, or perhaps it's you know, barren or something like that. I, I, I don't know. This is a, yeah. a new concept for me. So We're, I'm kind of we'll, we'll get to the silliest case. Yeah. Well, it, it's the it's the thing England used to roll into Georgia and say Terra Nullis uh, under the doctrine it of discovery. Dibs. This is now <laughs> ours. Or I mean, manifest, literally, that, yeah, manifest destiny is another example. But but that's this is the the legal right that was claimed by the crown. Mm-hmm. When they rolled into the the new world for the first time, and then as they continue, Thomas Jefferson claimed Terra Nullis and Doctrine of Discovery as he went, uh, as he sent people westward, right, um, Lewis and Clark it, style, and also yeah. um, that's another example. Like uh, also. That is going to be, spoiler folks, that's kind of our conspiratorial turn, and that's going to be one of the most important parts of the exploration tonight, because this can be weaponized. I thought we would enjoy uh, just a little bit of the background of how humans got to Terra Nullius, because it's it's pretty recent relatively, like the phrase being written in international law. That only happens in the late 1800s. But in practice, it's obviously so much older, and it's related to a concept I had never heard of, res nullius. That It's a Roman idea from Roman law, and it literally means nobody's thing. What's that? That's nobody's thing. thing. Uh, Do you want it? It's nobody's. Yeah, exactly. 
So, I mean, if you wanted to take it back to those earliest uh, origins in the Roman days, um, stuff that was considered res nullius uh, was legally up for grabs by anyone who happened upon it. Uh, and this was a little tricky because Roman law only saw certain people uh, as people. And this is going to apply to, to to a lot of the manifest destiny stuff and some other stories, uh, you know, from other parts of the world that we're going to get to. It's very common that the the invading forces only recognize people who look like them as as being, uh, you know, worthy of possessing things. And anyone else, nah, you might as well just be livestock. You know, get get out of here. This is mine. Yeah, my understanding is it really did relate to, do you have an army that can tell us no? Like, well, that's, that's when we roll true. in, right? Uh, is there a, a small French occupation in a part of this land, right? If we're England rolling through. If there is, then we got a problem. If there's not, then we get to claim it. Right. Or we'll have a war. Why not? Yeah. yeah but like but it is weird, like... I don't know. I know it's not directly related to Christianity in any way, but it does seem like the Christian based powers that were practicing uh, colonization really were the ones that were out there claiming this stuff. Yeah. Using that term and ideology with ideology has always been a tremendously powerful tool of rationalization, you know, in the, in the, in the dawn of the great caliphates or in the heyday of the great caliphates, they did very much the same thing. They just didn't call it terra nullius. They said, you know, we are the people in the right, right? Our belief in Islam is, uh, justifies our expansionist tendencies and all the violence we may enact upon the infidels. That, that was certainly the case with Spanish as well, like Spanish yeah. conquistadors, you know, who were out there murdering and pillaging as well in the name of God, because they felt as though they were imbued with some sort of like mystical power from God that it gave them the right to do this. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we look at the modern day, this is a pretty surprising thing. This is a very dark topic. If you look at the modern day, you can still do terra nullius. You can still claim this. Like if we, for some reason, had a boat, just for some reason, let's call it the USS Conspiracy, and we're sailing the high seas, and our guest producer, Ben Hackett, is like, you guys, I would did not sign up for all this. But he, we've conscripted him. We're all in our tiny four-person Navy, or five-person with you listening. Does it home. have a dinghy? Of course. Why not? It you needs know, a dinghy. It has all the stuff. And as we're sailing in international waters that no one state controls, we see a newly formed volcanic island. Maybe it's like way out in the Pacific, like around Point Nemo or something. And so we can sail up to this island. We can occupy it ourselves or, which is more likely, we can claim it in the name of another nation, another established state. And with just that explanation and nothing else, we can we we go around and pitch the idea to other world powers, and we're like, hey, you know, U.S. We found this island. We you put guys, your flag in it. We put your flag in it. We we thought you would be cool with that. Is that all right? Like, are you going to arrest us or do we get a medal? <laughs> it's so weird. It is, and it's pretty uncool because we see examples of it in the modern day. And earlier, the question was like, can you guess? What parts of the world are most likely to be quote unquote unclaimed today? Like, and I say this as in parts of the world that don't have act, people actively living on them. You Antarctica. Nailed it. You nailed it. You nailed it. Nailed it. Yes. Antarctica. It's uh, not the coolest place to live, or I guess technically it is one of the it's, coolest it's places cool. to live. It's quite yeah. cool. Yeah. There's a place called Mar Marie Bird Island. It's the largest case of terra nullius on the planet. It's huge. It's like 6,200,000 square miles in West Antarctica, and nobody wants it. I want it. I'll claim you it. it. You got yeah. it? Yeah. Dude, that ice is going to melt soon. Let's go. Let's see, <laughs> right? let's see what we find under there. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's one guy who is... Try, tried to claim it. There, there are two guys instrumental in history. One is uh, Admiral Richard E. Byrd, might mm -hmm. be familiar, right? Operation High Jump. Shout out New Schwabia. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, when when German forces went down and uh, occupied some land in Antarctica. And dude, uh, we've talked about this many times in the past, but look at some point when you've got some free time. Look at the territorial divides 
that exist in Antarctica. Uh, mostly, I guess the closest part of is that is that right towards South America? Looking at, Africa? I'm trying to imagine the map in my head mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. it's divided up in these weird little pie. It's a pie, basically. Yeah, yeah. And this is the um, this discovery goes before quote unquote discovery. Every time we say discovery, folks, please picture a lot of air quotes and caveats because other people are clearly aware of this and you don't need the Piri Rees map to prove it. So Admiral Richard E. Byrd is uh, flying over this territory in 1929 and he sees this expanse of desolate Arctic desert that is just horrible. Like it's impossible to live there even now. It's so inhospitable that they can't even camp there te- uh, temporarily. So they have to go to the nearby Ross Ice Shelf and sleep there. It makes you wonder why he named it after his wife. What was going on there? I guess we'll never know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we can side with optimism and say maybe he just wanted to impress her, which is what. I think we all do in relationships. You want to impress your partner, right? So hopefully it was happy, but not much has changed. Uh, the climate is warming. And it's, a, it's a good time to get in early. Some people might say, but it's so much trouble to occupy this place. And there aren't really proven resources that justify it. And you would be gambling against the Antarctica treaties. So you would run the risk of other nations getting really mad at you, even if you were like, you guys weren't using it. Then they might say, hey, but you signed a piece of paper. And then, like you said, Matt, it comes down to the armies. There have been a couple of expeditions since 29, but most of the observation has to be from the air. And, uh, Noel, if if Matt does try to take over and declare a micronation, he's going to have one dissenting voice that we know of. One one guy is going to be like, hey, I already called dibs. Is it the guy that runs the ice cube observation thing that's nuts out there that we talked about? <laughs> uh, no. Because all that exploration is in the name of science, right? At yes. least most of it is the, the, the army slash scientific exploration. Yeah. What happens if someone gets murdered in McMurdo, right? There's that episode. No, there's a guy uh, just learned about in 2001 in uh, a seaman. <clears throat> we're adults, uh, for the U.S. Navy named Travis McHenry. He said, I'm going to declare this my own nation. It is the Grand Duchy of West Arctica. I love a Grand Duchy, y'all. <laughs> I do love a Grand Duchy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the story is super weird. Um, he did this while serving as a seaman. I'm a child. Uh, in the United States Navy. Uh, when the Navy found out that he was contacting foreign governments um, and, you know, floating uh, this new nation to them, they quickly uh, told him to knock it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Today, this micronation um, has somewhere around 2,356 citizens, uh, though none actually live there. I guess they're, what, citizens like... In spirit, who yeah. are we talking here? Oh, he's yeah. got the right idea. It's for them. It's post melt, post melt society. That's what it's going to be, and everybody's going to move there. Uh, about two hundred of them will make it there, and uh, it'll it'll prosper. You guys, I can see it. Yeah, yeah. Travis is a forward looking dude. Uh, he also, I don't like to recommend Wikipedia, but his Wikipedia page is very interesting. If he edits ever- it himself. He seems like the kind of guy that would edit it himself. <laughs> he might, maybe in the talk section. So whenever you, whenever you have to look at a Wikipedia article, I can't recommend enough. Go to the talk tab. That's where you see the Wikipedia wars. That's where you uh, see the editors beefed up with each other and mentioning very weird things. I'm gonna do that. Yeah, I bet you'll find some cool stuff. Uh, but so yeah, the U.S. Navy says, "Hey, bud, no." You know, stop writing to these other countries, trying to get them to recognize you. And uh, he bought some land in the Carolinas. I believe, you know, if you reach out to him, you can petition to become a citizen of this. Sort of like, what's that place off the coast of the UK? Sealand, right? Like you can, it's an old fort that a guy made into a micronation and you can apply to be a member of the, or a citizen of the Principality of Sealand. That sounds familiar, but I cannot confirm. Nor I, then, nor I. Oh, uh, micronations. We'll get there one day. If this U.S. We citizenship did a ridiculous history out. about it, that's for sure. Yeah. It's been quite a minute. 
Yeah. I know there was one, there was one story about a guy who established a micronation like on a raft. Yes. I do, I do remember that one vaguely, but the, the details are escaping me. I think micronations might be big for us in, uh, <laughs> in Q4, as they say. Uh, but there is a happy ending with this one because McHenry turned West Antarctica into a nonprofit and they advocate for biodiversity and Antarctic wildlife in the face of climate change. So that sounds ooh, like ooh, a good ooh. One. Th- yeah. There is a, a highly nerdy looking board game called Sealand. Uh, mm-hmm. And the, the tag is cleverly place crops and windmills to become the wealthiest burger in the Netherlands. Mm. It is all about claiming new land, though. So, it yeah. sounds like settlers to me. But whatever. It looks like settlers, dude. <laughs> it Catan looks exactly like settlers. Uh, for everything is not octagonal. Board, for everybody's not a board game nerd, we're talking about settlers of Catan. Which I have never played, but um, I, I've it's heard fun. it's good. I am a, I'm a wingspan man, mm-hmm. I think I've mentioned. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I I've saw been, it on your table. You're damn right. <laughs> it was unopened, though. I actually just purchased the actual board game. We play it with our friends and also the online uh, editions, but I just got the actual physical board game version. I'm going to bust that out this weekend, y'all. Maybe one day I'll be lucky enough to play with you guys. Oh, I, dude, I we love it. We still it. have, we owe Matt a, a game night with his fancy new gaming table. Oh, I'm man. prepared. Yeah. So much room for activities. I'll bring a boatload of cash to dump out in the middle of that sucker. <laughs> so much room for activities. <laughs> uh, so, okay. So there's another thing here that McHenry teaches us, which is a lot of people hear this idea of terra nullius or some version of it, and they kind of take it as a challenge or an invitation, and it almost never works out. But here we get to this, guys, this is one of my favorite ones. Here we get to the most surreal and ridiculous and kind of funny uh, story of Terra Nullius. Beer Tawil, which I am almost certainly mispronouncing because we are not native speakers. In my mind, I'm picturing a beer towel, you know, for like <laughs> nice. dabbing your, your mouth when you spill a little of your beer. Yeah, it's, it's tiny. It's like less than 800 square miles. And if you pull up the map, Uh, you'll see it it looks like a postage stamp. It doesn't make sense. It would be such a big deal. It's like a little quadrilateral area. Well, isn't that interesting though, Ben, because a lot of these things are almost more symbolic than they are actually like of significance, you know, in terms of like, uh, you know, commerce or whatever it might be. It's because that's the point. These borders, what they represent sometimes is more meaningful than where the actual borders are. Yeah, I think that's a good observation. So this thing, this tiny little thing was a map uh, mishap, I guess. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, a disagreement. Great. And for more than a century, Egypt and Sudan have both been constantly saying, no, you, you take that one. They're constantly trying to voice this 800, like they beef up over it. They're trying to force the other nation to say, okay, I'll take this 800 square miles because of the map discrepancy. In uh, like 1899 and 1902 were two maps that came out. And one said, Bir Tawil is the uh, land of Sudan. And this other piece of land called the Halib Triangle is Egypt's. And the Halib Triangle is way cooler. It's much more attractive real estate. It's got access to the Red Sea. It's much bigger. Uh, (laughs) It's more friendly if you want to live there. So each country has like those in the second map, by the way, reversed it. So we have one map that says Egypt controls Bir Tawil, but not the other triangle. And then the other map says Sudan controls Bir Tawil, but not the other triangle. So if either nation takes ownership of this one little tiny piece of land, then they automatically lose the land they really want. It's Dang. ridiculous. But well, then who controls the land? they all really want right now nobody but it's (laughs) the triangle is is also the same the triangle is well if you ask them they both they both will say they control it well which army is in there somebody's got military officers somewhere i I think it's like the, the line of actual control in china and india in the himalayas i feel like they have uneasy standoffs and the people living in the area are just kind of 
hoping the shoe doesn't drop in their generation. And just to kind of like uh, hammer home what a big deal some of this stuff is, you know, for the countries that, that are kind of uh, disputing them. Um, Barbie, the movie, was uh, unceremoniously pulled from release in China because of a basically like crayon doodle of a map depicting a, a version of, uh, of, of China in that part of the country um, that – I believe was was not uh, to the liking of Chinese officials because of something to do with uh, their claim on on Vietnam or or part of like something that violates their sovereignty. Uh, something called the uh, the nine dash line. Oh, it's my mistake. It was Vietnam that had the issue um, because they believe this claim of China on parts of the South China Sea violates their sovereignty. I see. So they were like, no, nah, no, nah, this is not cool, Barbie. We're not letting you release your movie here. Hmm. So, guys, are we going to travel over there? Should we plant a flag and just say, no, hey, guys, we understand. We'll take it. We'll take it. <laughs> because I know it's hard to live there, but we if you put a building on there that's got yeah. some hydroponics and a nice yeah. igloo, we can come on. Let's do this. Some AC. <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh man let's uh, we'll have to set up wi-fi too so we can record but uh yeah did you guys see that show uh murder at the end of the world uh yes um, i think I did. there's like yeah. an elon musk type figure like you know like he's like a big tech mogul gajillionaire and the, the, he has this hotel that he builds it's basically like you know part of it is above ground level um in i forget some really really frozen tundra part of the world but the rest of it is underground like so far down that would protect you from like nuclear blasts basically like a really really fancy fallout shelter so we can get the funds together to mm -hmm. build something like that mm -hmm. count me in boys okay let's write to a county let's just let's just pitch it right there's sure. nothing wrong with brainstorming uh, asking costs nothing and then you know maybe we can be it, actually you know what I'll do it as long as we can call it the El Tovar Hotel. Oh, I like it. Or it can also be Bentopia. Oh, no, 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 no. Sure, the, no come on. That's got a ring to just it. Just because on. there are two Bens in the in the founding fathers here, I don't think we should lean into that. we got to find a better name. You it's know? just the pithiest name. I, it's fine. Okay, we, we, we can workshop. We can workshop. We could call it Beer Tawil Plus. There you go. <laughs> so um, to, to this question... You're, you're absolutely right, Matt. Um, there are no permanent residents. There are kind of desperate prospectors who set up temporary mining camps to hunt for gold. And then there are uh, nomadic communities that move through that area in their migration. But no, there's no static community living there because it's very hot. It's a desert. There's not any surface water. It's like Mad Max style. But it, no, wait, wait. Well, it's the perfect location mm -hmm. for where humanity sets up the first AI controlled sovereign area. There we go. Yeah. Right. L let the robots figure out the water. It's like the, it's Animatrix, baby. It's going to happen. It's just <laughs> like that. Oh, man. Uh, you, I mean, I. Did you just reference yeah. the Animatrix? Yeah. <laughs> it's good. Wow. Animatrix is I know. Good. It's just funny. It's just like that's, that's it's a deep, slightly deeper cut. Our History guy loves of the, the Matrix. Matrix Part 1. Yeah. Also, uh, I'm, I'm legitimately concerned about listening to this episode a few years from now and realizing how prescient that statement was, because that is good casting. As long as we don't accidentally turn on people's Alexa. Oh boy. Yeah. God Thanks forbid. to everybody who wrote in. So oh God, no, you're right. It's going to be, it's going to be West Antarctica, isn't it? Cause the cold temperatures are actually, will be beneficial for the computing power. There'll be, Oh God. Okay. Well, all right. also North pole. Cause a lot of islands are coming out from under the ice. True. That's a great one. Yeah. Um, what we're saying is invest in the poles guys. Forget we're playing small time. If we're trying to flip houses, let's start flipping poles. Yeah. Pole shift? We're going to pole shift from positive to negative, pole baby. Shift this, the whole thing, baby. How do magnets work? Uh. <laughs> God. Oh, man. I'm waiting in fear for uh, an expert in magnets to write to us. Uh, but anyway, the, um, the thing about this is beer to will, although it is not paradise on earth and it is very hot and somewhat inhospitable, it's the most habitable, quote unquote, terra nullius around. And multiple people have tried to create a micronation there, but the vast majority have never visited. They post online. They start a website. 
And they're like, mm, the nation, beer Tawil, with oh, your buddy, Johnny Blue Jays. Yeah. Keyboard warriors. Get out. Go take a trip. Plan an actual flag, nerds. <laughs> right. Oh, man. I, I wonder what our flag would look like, too. But, okay, there are other examples of this, um, especially around the Danube post-Serbia-Croatia conflicts. Uh, there will probably be more examples in the future. Like you said, Noel, the idea of borders, although they seem permanent, they're quite ephemeral. But there's a darker side to the story, and I think it's one that we all really wanted to talk about. This is the most important aspect of Terra Noli. It's past all the weird jokes and the Joseph Heller kind of stuff. Uh, I propose we pause for a word from our sponsor and then get into the deep water. What do you say? Yes. <laughs> we've returned and you know we're fun we're fun at parties we like a good joke we we did the thing with beer to will that's kind of ridiculous but the more important part the frankly terrifying part and the very real conspiracy is this the idea of terra nullius in name and or in practice has often been used by very powerful expansionist forces to justify atrocities, occupation, colonization. You think gentrification in your city is bad? Imagine that wide scale on a nation, right? Uh, on on a land, somewhat, you know, uh, one of the, like Apocalypto, right? An amazing film and one of the most frightening parts of Apocalypto, despite all of the crazy graphic violence and action, one of the most frightening parts is the very, very end. Spoilers, folks, three, two, one. The real monster comes at the end. It's the Spanish conquistadors. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're, uh, yeah I, got, I don't know. I'm going to sound like a total, like, you know, um, woke white dude or whatever, but I'm just so happy to see uh, how much representation indigenous people are getting in pop culture over the last handful of years. I just feel like I just didn't see that much of it. And now you've got like shows like Reservation Dogs and uh, even even like The Curse, which is, you know, a, a weird cringeworthy kind of satire. It, it deals with some of this stuff of cultural appropriation. And then specifically, I just watched Killers of the Flower Moon, which is about what happened after it stopped being okay just to kill Native Americans outright and take their land. Uh, so they had to do it a little more low key, <laughs> covertly, but nothing actually changed. Uh, it was just kind of everything went underground, you know, in terms of like the awful, despicable things that uh, white people did in order to rob these folks of, of their livelihood and property and land. You're absolutely right, I would say, because the... The methods may change, but the aim remains constant and the same. You know, it's still the days of rest nullius, nobody's thing. And if you can convince yourself and other powerful forces that something is nobody's thing, then you will you will get very quickly to an argument of might makes right, which is evil and unethical, but happens all the time. And when we talk about this, obviously... You know, there are multiple examples. Uh, one of the most notorious of ter terra nullius as a conspiracy occurs in Australia. And Australian friends in the audience, fellow conspiracy realists, you are doubtlessly very well aware of this and know more about it than we do. But um, we're surprised to find that in the early days of what we call modern Australia, the governor captain, Arthur Phillip, proclaimed the creation of the penal colony, right, of New South Wales. And really leaned on the concept of terra nullius and said, look, we found this big empty continent. There are no real humans here. So we claim this. We're going to make it a, a prison camp for the British Empire. At the time, Aboriginal communities had lived on the continent for more than 50,000 years. I can't even imagine how long of a time that is. They had hundreds of different languages. They had a long, rich history in what we call Sydney alone. There were like 8,000 people. And the British said, well, they didn't call dibs. So now we are doing that. Yeah. And they don't look like us. And so they don't have a flag. Can, yeah. As far as we're concerned, they, they, they don't deserve this land that they, they, they've you know, settled and and made their home for generations. Well, again, I think it goes back to that concept of we do not recognize any body that could claim sovereignty over this land, so we therefore do claim it. And 
uh, the human beings that we are encountering do not have the weapons that we have, so we can exert force. And we yeah. can decide that it's ours. And it's really important to remember that they only legally claim sovereignty over the land, right? According to the laws recognized in the country that's By claiming them. it. Yes. Right. And then any, and Ben, as you said, any, what is it? The, anyone who recognizes the authority of that authority hmm. is then buying into this fiction that they now own this land. Uh it's just, and it's so infuriating, and this is the definitely the best example of it uh, that comes to mind. But then, when you start to peel back the onion and you look at the whole, but the whole of the world, and how this basic concept has created everything that we, everything that I, as a human being, love, uh, this horrible concept created it. Yeah, the benefits that carry down. You know, we often don't realize the origin of those things, right? The reason that you can live so far inland in the United States and get pretty much anything you want, so long as you can afford it, that comes from that. The reason that the national parks are so awesome is because the indigenous communities that lived here thousands and thousands of years ago didn't wreck it. I was about to say... Yeah, and it just goes to show, too, with, like, westward expansion, like, how the idea of getting in on the ground floor like that and getting your piece of the pie when it was all being divvied up, you know, was such an important thing, you know, because land is everything, you know? Like, that's where you build your home. That's where you stake your claim. That's where you make your legacy. Mm, it's very interesting to read. You know, we are of a generation, folks, where the three of us, I don't know about you, Ben H., but we grew up playing uh, a game called Oregon Trail in school, and it was very much uh, a romanticization of Manifest Destiny, right? And in in different versions of this game, some things didn't age well. Let's put it that way. It's also very interesting to read early advertisements for settlers or for pioneers, right? That were saying travel from the West Coast, we'll have a lottery on this new territory, right? And for peanuts, for pennies on the dollar, you can get this massive homestead. And all you have to do is get out there and live there. And I think I've mentioned this show from BBC, The English. Um, it's, it's, it's a very, very epic sweeping kind of period piece, but there is a character in it who's a, who's a native American. And his whole deal is that he is, he has been promised this land that he is owed. That was land that was taken away from his, you know, his tribe. Um, but it becomes abundantly clear that they are never going to pay him what he's owed because he is not in that club and they will never see him in that way. And he kind of finally has to make that realization, you know, that like, no, I'm, I'm never going to be treated fairly. Uh, I have to make my own way and, and, and realize that what's been taken from me is never going to be given back to me because it is might makes right. And, you know, Kissinger would agree. Right. Uh, so the, again, the methods and the rationalizations may change, but the aim has always been the same. It also reminds me in the world of fiction of the excellent series Taboo. Do you guys remember that one? It came out a oh, few yes. years ago. Oh, I've mentioned that recently too with uh, Tom Hardy. Boy, is that good and, mm. and dark, 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 dark. And there is, there is a storyline there about uh, trying to acquire land in the so-called new world. Uh, we don't know how it'll work because it's been years and years since season two, but it's worth tuning in. And it's something, it's a conspiracy that really, without hy hyperbole, terra nullius affects everyone. There's a very successful set of conspiracies, intergenerational with ramifications that continue today. And one of the questions I have, and this is something that kind of honestly keeps me awake at night. I mean, I'm already awake at night. You know what I mean? I think about it a lot. What happens in the future? You know, what happens is humanity expands into the moon and, you know, the first asteroid mines start up. Oh, yeah, dude. You, it's hard to plant a flag in space because there's really nothing to plant it on unless you've got something flying around up we there. We did it, though. USA. <laughs> Wait, but, but isn't there sort of a gentleman's agreement that, like, nobody can own space? Yes. Sure. 
Sure. sure. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. cool <laughs> yeah. Cool, cool. We're uh, good then, right? It's, yeah. it's got, that's got teeth. Can <laughs> I do a, okay? Can I do one hot take on that one? Because Please. I don't, I don't want to sound like a uh, a negative Nelson or whatever. But uh, <laughs> that to me has always felt very well intentioned, and people worked very hard on the various uh, treaties against the militarization of space or against owning land on the moon. But I am increasingly confident. Um, after several conversations, I'm increasingly confident that the powers, the world powers that agreed to that simply did it as a stopgap, as a waiting, Dude. baking in oh. a waiting time the until moment that it becomes their possible. technology arrived at such yeah. a point that they 100%. could enact their will. Yes. And then whoever has the biggest flag. <laughs> and then might makes right. Goes, yes, exactly. In mine now. Yes. What, we, we just did that project on the... Project for the New American Century episode, where we talked about in the year 2000, that think tank was calling for the United States to create a space force yeah. so that we might exercise sovereignty over all of space. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then guess what we created, guys? Just a couple of years ago. Space Force. Space Force. <laughs> space force. Love the name. Have you seen and the badges? Yes. And I've also <laughs> seen the TV show, which I very much enjoyed. Oh, yeah. Shout, Shout out Steve Carell. I was funny. Right. Yeah. I don't, really, I don't think it got renewed, but I did. I thought it was very funny. It was too close to the truth. It got shut so. down like that K Street <laughs> exactly. HBO yeah, series. <laughs> but, but then, okay, so I, I'm going to quote somebody here, uh, Robert J. Miller, who's writing in the Wyoming Law Review. Uh, this was from Volume 11, number two in the year 2011. Total banker. And I haven't read it. it. <laughs> <laughs> I obviously uh, haven't read it. Well, he's just shouting out two very specific uses, recent legal uses. We're talking international courts, legal uses of terra nullius. That is in August of 2007 when Russia evoked well they didn't invoke terra nullius they invoked the discovery doctrine which is like directly tied to this concept Kissing cousin for sure uh, they placed uh, according to robert they placed a titanium flag on the floor of the arctic ocean to claim the estimated 10 billion tons of oil and gas that is right under the surface there oh, and then in 2010 dang. china did the same thing Essentially, by claiming sovereign rights over the South China Sea by planting a flag at the bottom of the ocean in the center of the area that they are claiming, we like got a real a, flag. We got really did this. Yeah, yes, they did. And there's another. There's an episode we did related to this where I think we mentioned it, which is who will control the North Pole um, as the as the the northern passages become navigable. Right, a, a lot of countries. Uh, I don't know if we need to beat me here, Ben, but a lot of countries are getting left ass out because they didn't invest in their icebreakers and they didn't put some teeth behind their territorial claims. And if you look at the map, just like you were describing with the South Pole, the North Pole has a bunch of very ambitious pie slices, I will say, because, you know, the U.S. is only real attempt at a claim to sovereignty in the North Pole is Alaska. And they tried to they tried to slice that pizza slice bigger than it should be just being honest and then russia was all about putting down some flags you know subs and icebreakers they have the best ones they have the best icebreakers u.s has the best subs and sorry sorry this is maybe a silly question but like are there territorial claims on like deep parts of the ocean like other than what we're talking about here like for resource extraction but like you know what it what if technology comes uh, to light that will allow us to build some sort of giant undersea dome, you know, civilization. Like, when do we start having those arguments and disputes? Man, we had those millions of years ago, back in the first civilization, when we had the domes underwater. Mm -hmm. People Sorry, were flipping yeah. domes. That's how everything went wrong. There they was flipped this big, the dome. They you know, like the, the Gundam, <laughs> Gung, the Gungam, the Gungan city in the, <laughs> the, the bad Star Wars movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lemuria. Boss, boss Nass. Oh, uh, Sequest DSV? Sequest was cool. Yeah. Hell, C-Lab. C-Lab. Yeah, yeah. C-Lab. Yeah. I mean, I think also, I I know we're, sorry, Ben, because we're, now we're cooking with gas. Like we mentioned, we might. Um, we do have to end, but I love this direction because I got to ask, 
How likely do you think it is that modern undersea cities or metropolises will exist? I think it's increasingly likely yes. as the surface world gets uh, more and more untenable. Like, why, why wouldn't you if you could make it work? Yeah, just got to show up and say, this mine, mm-hmm. uh, this okay. my gun. I'm going to have that. Everybody yeah. <laughs> study vexillology. Clearly, you need a flag. We have to have flag. If you want to send a flag to us, pitch a flag idea for conspiracy stuff, for stuff they don't want you to know. That'd be interesting. I, I'd be in, into seeing that. I don't know. I think it'd be the creepy, drippy, six-fingered hand. Oh, capacity. Yeah. oh, no. We gave away the secret. Dang it. <laughs> Can I just get this out really fast, guys? Yeah, okay, good. So the United States begins to form as a conspiracy against the British crown, right? True, yeah. With the colonists who all came over here with the um, doctrine of discovery at it, like in their pocket from the crown, the crown in England said, go over there. Here's our doctrine of discovery concept. Use it. When you encounter anyone or anything, you claim this land and all the peoples who occupy that land. It's yours. Now uh, operate in this way, right? The 13 original colonies are formed through that doctrine of discovery. Then Thomas Jefferson, one of the guys that wrote the Constitution at, that fought against the crown and all of those powers, looks in his pocket and goes, oh, here's this doctrine of discovery concept that uh, the crown you know, sent us over here with. Let's go west and let's use this same idea and we'll do, the, we'll do it all over and we're going to claim all of this for ours mm-hmm. just as they did. Right. Um, it, there's something so... Um, horrifying about that to me i just look at some point when you get a chance look through the history and and again it's that you guys have talked about the lewis and clark expedition at length i know you have on ridiculous history right and we've talked about it a little bit on this show and maybe for some other shows i just remember having conversations with you guys off air about those expeditions the louisiana territory astoria which is a whole insane story on its own john astor's isn't it john astor maybe i'm wrong the the guy who founded astoria the first thing uh in the pacific north northwest it was like a settlement that became the reasoning behind oh this is the united states territory now right 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 um like the it the story behind all of that and the core of northwestern discovery it all just it really is horrifying and I do not like looking at it or thinking about it. What can, can, can we can we devil's advocate really quickly? Like, what is the alternative? Like, what what could have led us to have the civilization that we have today um, that involved playing nice and Honoring playing fair? Treaties. Okay, fair enough. Which the U.S. absolutely uh, did but, not. But, but but then we wouldn't. I don't think we wouldn't be what we are today if we had just played nice. You know, I, I just think it's I think it would, it would be it would be something completely different, not resembling, you know, the world that we see today, which I'm, I'm not saying is good or bad. I it just, could be different, but it, being different doesn't mean it would be unequal to the current day. Right. Like there's I I understand the allure of zero sum calculation and it, it, it does occur pretty often. But um, maybe it's kind of Pollyanna. Like, I hear you, man. And I think you're right. I just wish there was a better way. You know, and just like the stock market, just like the current geopolitical order, that kind of better way is another collective fiction. And it only works if the majority of civilization participates. That's right. No, that's that's well said. Ben. I, I think to get what we have now, you need you need armies and or people with weapons to go into a territory to claim land that holds resources that some entity can then use to turn into goods right and services and all of that stuff to then build power mm. to make more guns sure. to do that in more places i, I it is I, weird it feels I, like I, that has well, to happen well it's i would argue, justification yeah. for the government saying your tax money has to be spent on all these tanks has to be spent to make our military the best military because otherwise everything you have is is you know in, in question <laughs> people hate when i say it but there is a little bit of validity to that the U, the global economy works because the U.S. Navy in particular ensures the passage of goods. Uh, it's not a good thing necessarily, but it does work. And I, I would say one thing we're forgetting here, too, is that 
you know how sometimes in a in a strategy game or a, a video game of any sort, you can find a loophole and you can sort of break your character or break a battle. The U.S. has kind of done that with the feedback loop of armament and combined with the enormous geographical barriers. It is incredibly difficult to get all the way over the Pacific, all the way over the Atlantic right? Let alone get inside the interior of the U.S., or it has been for quite some time, which is part of why the U.S. benefited so greatly from the post-World War II economic boom. The game was broken for a minute, right? And it led to a superpower that was able to um, exercise a feedback loop in a way that was unparalleled since the, maybe, the Mongol Empire, when they figured out horses, and cavalry attacks. I mean, the you we can say the U.S. made a lot of terrible missteps, and that's true. We can say the U.S. had a lot of well-intentioned things, and that's also true. But the one thing we have to point out is that the U.S. was very, very lucky. Just like in game, like in the game Civilization, where you sometimes luck out and you get, you know, your civilization starts on a continent by itself. But the U.S. didn't, obviously, because they. Committed genocide. I don't know. Wheels within wheels. Oh, exactly. Let's point out just one thing that this website, ruleoflaw.org.au, points out. Ben, you, you shared this link, but there's a... I don't know much about this, but according to that website, uh, under European Settlement and Terra Nullius, in 1992, the Australian High Court... Uh, saw a case that basically legally overturned what that site calls the Terra Nullius fiction, right? Which I think we've kind of pointed out. It's all one big fiction. Um, and they actually recognized in that year, 1992, that indigenous peoples of Australia uh, have a deep connection to the land. And it that led to this thing called the Native Title Act of 1993, uh, that went through parliament there in Australia. So at least one good thing occurred, right? But, you know, as we know, that's one happy little moment in a sea of tragedy. Yeah. Sort of like how we discover new species because the uh, ecology of the world is on fire. I don't know. You got to take the winds, right? And um, with this, you know, we went in a lot of directions, folks. I, I think we could argue we're also setting up some episodes in the future uh, regarding borders, regarding uh, hidden history, for lack of a better term. We would love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your opinions on this. We'd love to hear your uh, whether you think this is a zero-sum world and somebody else's win is inherently someone else's loss, uh, or whether there's a better way possible. Perhaps most importantly, pitch us the flag. If and if this episode has proven anything, we are sorely in need of a flag, you know. Isn't that the term pitching a flag to like raise a flag? <laughs> it's both. It's both. I'm doing levels. We're doing all oh, Love it. Love it. <laughs> uh, and I think, you know, personally, I think, no, you're right. I think we got a winner with the hand. That just makes a big impression. Right. So we'll get to the moon. We'll get to the ocean. We can't wait to hear from you. That's right. And you can reach out to us uh, in many different ways, innumerable ways. Uh, first and foremost, via your social media platform of choice, where we exist at the handle Conspiracy Stuff on uh, Facebook, where we have our Facebook group, Here's Where It Gets Crazy, on YouTube, where we're chock a block with video content uh, every single week, uh, and also on X, FKA Twitter. Hey, do you like calling people with your phone? You can call us. Our number is one eight three three S T D W Y T K. When you call in, like Eagle Scout did, to let us know about this rumor going around the internet that Russia had declared the sale of Alaska to the United States as being illegitimate, Seward's uh, folly turns out to be a bit of misinformation, uh, disinformation rather that was spread around. That is not true, Eagle Scout. Uh, we did some digging on that. If you want to call in like that, give us an update on this episode or anything we've covered in the past. Please do. You've got three minutes. Give yourself a cool nickname and let us know if we can use your message on the air. If you've got more to say than can fit in three minutes, you've got links, attachments, whatever. Why not send us a good old fashioned email? We are the people who read every email we get. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com.
Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.